Genel izleyici kitlesi için uygundur. Farkından merhabalar. Farklı ülkelerden konuklarla bölgesel ve küresel meselelere ilişkin farklı perspektiflere yer vermeye çalışıyoruz. Her hafta dünyayı EkoTürk ekranında buluşturuyoruz. Bu hafta e, Sidney'e uzanacağız, Avustralya'nın başkentine. 2023'te yayınlandığında dünyada çok ses getiren, kısa bir süre önce de Özlem Özarpacı'nın çevirisiyle Metis yayınlarından Türkçesi de çıkan bu kitabı bu hafta konuşacağız, tanıtacağız. Filistin Laboratuvarı, İsrail işgal teknolojilerini dünyaya nasıl ihraç ediyor e, bu kitap aslında e, gazeteci, yazar Anthony Lowenstein'in çıkarmış olduğu, yazmış olduğu bir kitap. Uzun yıllar Filistin'de yaşamış bir isim kendisi. Aynı zamanda Alman vatandaşı da olan Avustralyalı gazeteci Anthony Lowenstein. Batı Şeria ve Gazze'nin işgali İsrail Devleti'ne düşman olarak tanımladığı Filistinlileri denetleme ve gözetleme teknolojileri konusunda paha biçilemez bir deneyim kazandırdı diyor kitabında. Filistin'i nasıl mükemmel bir laboratuvar haline getirdiğini İsrail'in Belgelerle, raporlarla, tanık ifadeleriyle deşifre ediyor. Yahudi bir gazeteci kendisi. Ee, İsrail'in Filistin'e yönelik saldırılarına karşı çıkan Avustralyalı Yahudiler özellikle arasında güçlü bir sesi de temsil ediyor. Bu hafta işte bu kitabı, bu kitap ışığında İsrail'in Filistin'de yaptıklarını, yapmak istediklerini konuşacağız. Sidney'e uzanacağız. Anthony, uh, thank you very much. Hello. Uh, thanks for joining Hello. us today. Thanks so much for having me on. It's great to be here. Good to see you and uh, congratulations on this uh, brilliant, Thank wonderful uh, book. Really, I learned a lot as a journalist. Uh, this is the, Thank you. I'm sure you have seen the Turkish uh, <laughs> edition of the book as well, but this is the book, your book in mm -hmm. Turkish. I love so, it. Yes. <laughs> we love it as well. Thank you very much. So, Anthony, mm -hmm. uh, let's start with why do you call it a laboratory, a Pal Palestine laboratory? And also, you define an occupation industry, uh, so it, it is something beyond an occupation, an ordinary occupation. What does that really mean? How does it look like? Uh, please elaborate on us uh, for the Turkish audience. In a way, when I talk about the laboratory, it really started pretty much even before Israel was born in 1948. And what I mean by that is that pretty much since Israel's birth, so close to 80 years now, Israel has always viewed Palestinians as a threat, as a problem to be solved, so to speak. And the way they did that was in various methods over the years to control people, to uh, find ways to isolate them, to surveil them, monitor them. And this really accelerated in 1967. There was a six-day war. Israel took control of East Jerusalem, Gaza, the West Bank and the Golan Heights. And that occupation has been going on now for well, close to 60 years. And people obviously in Turkey are well aware of that occupation. Yeah. They read about it all the time, long before October 7, 2023, of course, much more now so because of what's happening in Gaza and Lebanon. But essentially what I'm talking about is that Israel is using Palestinians as guinea pigs, as test subjects in various ways to test various forms of control and separation. So in the modern era, I'm talking about drones, spyware, biometric tools, various things like that. And then when that is done to Palestinians, the millions of Palestinians under occupation, Israel then sells and markets that to huge amounts of nations around the world and says it's so-called battle tested. And I estimate in the book that there are, a, we don't even know the exact number of how many nations Israel has sold equipment to in the last decades, anywhere between about 125 and 150. So the majority of nations on the planet And Israel is the ninth biggest arms dealer in the world. Yeah. And that's remarkable, really, for a massively tiny country. I mean, Israel is a country of 10 million people. It's a small place. And yet it has such an outsized influence on the global arms industry. And it's because the occupation of Palestine is so profitable for Israel. Mm -hmm. Anthony, I also want to ask before and after October 7, how uh, the impact of October 7 will be. But also, let me ask you first, because you have spent years uh, pouring over declassified documents like speaking to victims around the world, reporting on the companies, high-tech companies. So I also wonder what are your findings or what are the most shocking, what shocked you the most while making uh, research on, on this book? 
specifically? Look, in some ways, yeah, look, there are so many, but what often comes to mind, a lot of people will be aware that Israel uses a lot of spyware. So essentially, this tool is put on your mobile phone, Android or iPhone, and a country is able to get access to all your information. Now, I interviewed lots of victims of that around the world. So that is not a, a weapon, so to speak, that kills you. It's not a gun. It's not a missile. But it is massively um, problematic in terms of your personal details, your privacy. I was shocked, and a lot of people have been who've read the book have said the same thing, that the European Union uses Israeli drones over the Mediterranean to monitor for refugees. Now, these drones are unarmed, but in the last years when the European Union has made a decision to not rescue huge amounts of people, mostly Muslims and brown and black refugees principally, yeah. the way that they are getting that inf information from what they see on the Mediterranean is a, a drone that flies 24-7 over the Mediterranean, which is Israeli. Why did the EU use an Israeli drone? Because it was tested and trialled first in Gaza in the last 15 or so years. There are so many examples. I mean, one other one briefly. Since October 7, there's been huge amounts of new weapons that Israel is testing in Gaza and Lebanon. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about quadcopters, so killer drones, other kinds of sophisticated weapons, surveillance tech. Now, obviously, there's been no international media to get into Gaza in the last 13 months because Israel has blocked it. Yeah. But even with the amazing number of Palestinian journalists, we know Israel's testing new weapons and they're already trying to sell them in, in international arms fairs. That's how the laboratory works. Mm -hmm. Well, Anthony, uh, let me ask this question at this point then. How did then uh, so-called almighty intelligence uh, military, strong mil military power, extensive surveillance systems, as you uh, explain mm -hmm. in your book as well, fail on October 7, do you think? Uh, does it mean or show that these systems uh, were ineffective in a way? And also, uh, how October 7 changed the impression or perception of Israel among people around the world, do you think, uh, in a positive or negative way? And do you think in general, like October 7 has weakened or strengthened Israel? Look, the question of what happened on October 7, on the one hand, is easy to answer. On the other hand, it's quite difficult, briefly. On the one hand, everything collapsed. The military collapsed, the intelligence collapsed, every, the army collapsed. I mean, literally, as anyone will know who watch television, who sees social media, Hamas was able to breach the border with Israel, they were able to be inside Israel for many, many hours. In fact, some of Hamas were in Israel for days. The military disappeared. The intelligence was simply, it failed. I mean, there's no other way to put it. It was a complete disaster from Israel's perspective the entire time. On the other hand, you would think, knowing that, that the Israeli defense sector would be no longer seen globally as a reliable partner. If you fail so miserably, yeah. who would take you seriously? Exactly. However. However, that has not been what has happened. You have seen since October 7 in the last 13 months, especially since Israel went into Gaza, which pretty much happened on the first day, but the ground forces army went into Gaza in late October 2023, and obviously now they're going into Lebanon and elsewhere, yeah. that Israel has its arms industry, as far as we can tell, has not been impacted. In fact, the opposite has happened that the latest figures we have for the Israeli arms industry is 2023. And it was the highest figures ever, 13.1 billion US dollars. Now, obviously, most of 2023 was before October 7, yes. But there's every indication that the figures for this year, which we're going to get next year, are high. All the top Israeli defense companies are reporting record profits. Uh, Anthony, now, but, uh, sorry to interrupt. Is it due to uh, sure. is it due to Western support? Or Western support is part of it, but not only. Hmm. One of the things that I talk about in the book, and it's happened since October seven, is yes, of course, without American support, Israel could not fight its wars in Gaza and Lebanon. That's true. However, however. Let's not forget a few other things. One, Germany is the second biggest provider of weapons to Israel and has been a key ally. Many other nations are still purchasing is Israeli technology, Israeli surveillance, not just Western countries, but others. As one example, India and Vietnam. 
India is Israel's biggest defence client, has been for years. Under Prime Minister Modi, who's a Hindu fundamentalist, Vietnam, an autocratic state in Asia, is an increasing large player in the Israeli arms sector. So it's not just the West. And in fact, I would argue that many nations who publicly may oppose what Israel is doing in Gaza, call it a genocide, call it mass slaughter, which I would agree with, yeah. none of that seems to have so far stopped them privately either potentially buying weapons or in years to come buying them. And why is that, briefly? Why? Because many nations look to what Israel is doing with admiration. Now, you ask at the beginning of your question, right. how has what Israel's been doing changed the image around the world? Well, I would guess, from what I understand, that the majority of Turkish people are fundamentally opposed to what Israel is doing. No question that's true. In much of the Arab Muslim world, the same. In the West, the picture is more complicated. Yes, there's been huge amounts of protests, as anyone has seen in America and Europe against what Israel's doing, but as the right and the far right politically are doing very well in parts of Europe, and Donald Trump just won election in right. the US, they are fanatically pro-Israel. For right. them, what Israel has been doing has been a good thing. For them, why they are fundamentally against Islam, they're fundamentally anti-Muslim, they don't like Hamas, they don't like Palestinians. I mean, there's a multitude of reasons. Israel is, gets complete impunity. So without international pressure, sanctions or boycotts or holding Israelis to account legally, this situation is only going to keep getting worse. Yeah, I will ask you about the ultimate goal, actually. I mean, so basically you think the current Israeli retaliation uh, will affect, or indeed it's already affecting in a positive way, its defense uh, sector. So what do you think, Anthony, uh, about the ultimate goal of Israel uh, in Gaza, in, in, the, in the Palestinian territories, and now elsewhere, uh, including Lebanon? What do you think the ultimate goal? Look, the ultimate goal in Gaza, I think, seems pretty clear, which is to make it unlivable, meaning it doesn't mean that no one's going to live there, but it means that the quality of life does not exist. So you have in Gaza now, we don't know the exact number. There used to be 2.3 million people. Some people, of course, have fled into Egypt in the last year. Let's say it's 1.8, 1.9 million Palestinians. Those who are trapped, essentially, indefinitely, there's no way to get out or in and out, are living and will live outrageously and shamefully for years as refugees in their own territory. They will be living in tents. They'll be living very badly for a long time. Israel, in my understanding, is interested in building settlements again in northern Gaza, at least. What, the, what used to happen in Gaza many years ago in 2005, Israel pulled out its settlements and its military, although Gaza remained occupied in different ways. Fast forward close to 20 years in 2024, and there's every indication that Israel is building massive long-term infrastructure in Gaza to bring settlers back, which is an insane, crazy idea. But I think that's the plan. The West Bank, it is to increase violence against Palestinians. The picture is very grim. Mm -hmm. And with the Trump administration coming in, it's been terrible under President Joe Biden, and now we have a situation with Trump, and he's bringing in to his cabinet f fanatical Zionist fundamentalists. It's in a very, very dark place, and Palestinians need friends, real friends, internationally. And I would like to hope that Turkey could be one of those real friends. Mm -hmm. uh, Anthony, uh, you actually witnessed uh, firsthand, you lived in, uh, in, in the Palestinian territories a long time, in West Bank, uh, in Gaza, and elsewhere. So actually, as you also mentioned, we know what was happening well before October 7, uh, especially in Gaza and in the West Bank. A lot of people, but still in the West, uh, think the tragedy started with uh, October 7. But as I said, you know the reality firsthand. And in the book, uh, this is from the book, quote, I witnessed, I witnessed how Israeli police constantly harassed and humiliated Palestinians. For non-Jews, the daily routine of the occupation was oppression, basically. As a Jew, I felt ashamed of what was done in my name. Uh, yeah. Well, you witnessed, as I said first, and how would you compare life uh, before uh, October 7? What did you see? Could you also uh, tell us more about your, uh, you know, personal account uh, in, mm -hmm. in, in, in Palestine while, while you were there? 
And still, yeah. uh, still, people do think, uh, think in the Western capitals, including uh, where you are based, uh, Sydney, that uh, the tragedy started uh, after October 7, or the narrative has changed uh, significantly after October 7, do you think? I think for a lot of people in the West, I'm talking about the political level, many in the media, though not all, of course, some in the public, Palestinians are seen as second-class citizens. There is profound racism against Arabs, against Muslims, against Palestinians, long before October 7. People in Turkey don't need me to tell them that. You're well aware of how many in the West view Muslims. This is a sad reality. Now, I'm not saying everyone in the West, of course, feels that way. We don't. But there is a sizable proportion of people who do. 9-11 showed that. that the, the deep, the so-called war on terror that the US unleashed after 9-11 was deeply racist against huge amounts of Muslims and Arabs across the world. Look, what I saw in Israel-Palestine, I visited there for the first time in 2005. I've been visiting there for many years since. I spent time in the West Bank and Gaza. I lived in East Jerusalem between 2016 and 2020. In fact, I was just there a few months ago. I'm working on a film uh, inspired by my book, which will be out soon. Mm. And the reality, I didn't go to Gaza, but I went to Israel and Palestine, mm -hmm. that the reality on the ground for Palestinians has been horrific long before October 7. Right. I think people in the West don't want to see this or don't want to accept this or are blind to it or frankly don't think that Palestinians deserve equal rights. And there is something, and I say this to someone who's Jewish, I'm not religious at all, but I'm more culturally Jewish, mm -hmm. that I think since the Holocaust, which killed most of my family in Europe, the ones who got out, escaped to wherever they could get a visa, Australia, yeah. America, Canada, wherever, I think there is still in many Western capitals a real willful blindness to non-Jewish life. In other words, Jewish life is seen as far more valuable Jewish blood is seen as far more valuable than Muslim blood. Now, I'm not saying everybody. Of course, I'm not saying of that. Of course, yeah. But I think there is a real, and I've seen this since October 7. I mean, it's so clear that October 7 to me was a horrific attack. I think it was a disaster on a thousand reasons. But it killed 1,100 people, roughly, Israelis, mm -hmm. many of whom are civilians, some of whom are soldiers. But there's been 40, 50, 60,000 Palestinians killed in Gaza, thousands killed in Lebanon. There is not even close to the same kind of Western elite outrage about yeah. those deaths, those killings. And what does that tell you? Jewish life is seen as more valuable. So for me, and growing numbers of Jews around the world, we do say not in our name that not all Jews support Israel at all. And growing numbers of Jews feel that way. But unfortunately, the opposite lobby is uh, very strong around the world, including uh, Washington, D.C. and other Western capitals. So personally, I also wonder, Anthony, how, uh, I mean, being Jewish and critical of, critical of Israel from the very beginning, how did this uh, affect your career, uh, professional journalism career, let me ask? Yeah, I mean, the short answer is, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yes, it has and it hasn't. The short answer is I've been working on as a journalist for 20 years. A lot of my work has not been about this issue. I've done work on uh, immigration and drugs and uh, Afghanistan, lots of other issues. But when it comes to this particular issue, my first book was called My Israel Question. Yeah. It came out in 2006. And it was a bestseller, which was the great part, but the not so good part was I got condemned in the parliament in Australia. I was There was hate mail, there was death threats, and that was often coming from other Jews, other Jews who saw a critical perspective as almost like I'm a traitor, and that has not changed in 20 years. Yes, there are more critical Jews in the public space and in the, in the Jewish communities around the world, from the US to Europe and elsewhere, but the Jewish establishment, the Israel lobby, whatever term you want to use, is still fanatically pro-Israel. as And often I have said over the years, the more extreme Israel becomes, and it is moving, in my view, towards a mm. likely theocratic future, not guaranteed, right. but mm. likely, the more fanatical its supporters in the West have to get as well. Mm. So mm. for me, I have a community of supporters. I have a supportive family. That's been a long journey to get to that point. But I know a lot of Jewish people who write to me all the time who say, we cannot speak out in our own families. We cannot speak out in our own communities because if we do, 
as in speak out critical of Israel, we will lose our family. I mean, it, sound, it might sound kind of insane, but there is this real fear. So for me personally, I'm not going to suggest my career has been impacted. I know maybe over the years now and then there's been some negative impacts, but overall I think it hasn't affected it because I haven't, I haven't shut up, basically. I mean, I just have kept <laughs> I'm glad doing you it didn't. And... I'm, I'm glad you didn't, Anthony. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Well, Thank Anthony, you also challenged the myth around uh, Israel as the only uh, successful democracy in the Middle East. Do you think people still buy this argument uh, in the West? Is it oh. really the case? What do you think about this? Uh, because you, I mean, also your book shows uh, very strong interventions by social media company enforcers to either ban yeah. Palestinians or censor them. Also, at this point, you might also uh, talk about Facebook, Instagram's involvement in the mm -hmm. Palestinian occupation. Uh, so maybe you can detail some Israeli social media operations that, as well at this point with this question. Uh, Israel is the only successful democracy in the Middle East. Yeah, I mean, if you ask me, do people accept it in the West? I mean, I fear too many people do. So the short answer is probably yes, but Look, I think in the last 13 months, since October 7, we've seen this mass uprising of people. Everyone in Turkey has seen these across the globe, particularly in the West, but obviously in your country too, but many countries, right. against what Israel is doing. Those protesters don't think Israel is a democracy. And in fact, Israel is, if you're Jewish, it might be a democracy, but if you're not, it's not a democracy. You can't occupy millions of people and call yourself a democracy. I mean, it's an absurd proposition. And look, you know, the impact of social media is an interesting one. Briefly, until really the last 10 or 15 years, Israel was relatively confident that they could have massive influence on the narrative in the West, saying, yes, we're a democracy, we're thriving for peace, it's these awful Arabs and Palestinians that want to kill us all. I mean, that's the nonsense that they peddle. Social media changes that equation, right? Because you have all these people around the world using Facebook, Instagram, now TikTok, whatever it may be with their own opinions. You have Palestinians themselves in Gaza, in the West Bank, anywhere else, speaking and showing the world the reality. And even though Israel has got massive influence to try to silence or influence those companies, essentially pressure them and, and bully them, although those companies are inherently pretty pro-Israel anyway, they're mostly based in the US and they have sympathy towards Israel. Mm -hmm. I think there is a sense that I would argue that that battle is a, is a losing one, that unless you censor every single social media account, public opinion is shifting on this question. I mean, that's based on the polling across the globe. And right. finally, it's worth saying that Israel also uses massive amounts of cloud services from Amazon and Google particularly to store huge amounts of military data. This has accelerated since October 7. And after that attack, and it's Israel's slaughter in Gaza and elsewhere, they have, Israel has um, hired far more cloud space from Amazon and Google. So those two massive tech companies, which influence all our lives really globally, are directly complicit in what Israel is doing in mm -hmm. Gaza and Lebanon. So yeah, I mean, big tech is a key part of the problem here, right. which is why there are growing numbers of employees of those companies that are protesting and speaking out against their actions. Mm -hmm. Well, Anthony, uh, I know it's a very broad question, but uh, let's end this uh, with a hopeful note, maybe. What is your hope for uh, a solution, something beyond uh, a ceasefire? Of course, we all uh, pray for a ceasefire, yeah. but a permanent solution to the Palestinian tragedy? Is it like, do you support two-state solution? Abraham Accords, whatever, uh, what is your hope uh, for the future solution to the Palestinian tragedy? Look, I think in the end, the only solution is one state. Now, when I mean one state, I mean one state where everyone lives together. Now, people might say that sounds crazy now, and that's not gonna happen next week. I'm well aware of that. I've, I co-wrote a, a book called After Zionism, which came out earlier this year. People can find it. It's only in English, not in Turkish. But hopefully it will be translated. Essentially, hopefully, indeed, inshallah. And there are a lot of essays in there by Jews and Arabs and Palestinians and others and myself explaining why this is the only equitable vision that I see a comparison to apartheid South Africa, which for years and years and years was a deeply repressive state, oppressing its minority black population. Now, South Africa today is not utopia. There's many problems in South Africa. I was just there recently. I'm well aware of that. But essentially, transition from an apartheid state 
to a one state where all citizens live together. Lots of problems, not right. denying that. That has to be the vision here, that the idea of separating populations does not and will not work. But there needs to be, in the short term, briefly, massive pressure on Israel to change. The only way South African apartheid ended was massive international pressure, yeah. sanctions, boycotts, arms embargoes. And that has to be enforced by states, including Turkey. So that, to me, is the is the necessary next step, along with holding Israeli generals and soldiers and politicians to account legally at international courts. Mm -hmm. That's a vital next step as well. Well, hopefully, uh, inshallah, as you also said. Thank you very <laughs> much, Anthony. A pleasure Thank to you. meet you, really. Uh, thanks for this brilliant uh, work and keep up the good work, Thank please. You Thank so you so much. Evet saat so farkında much. bu hafta Anthony Lovenstein'i ağırladık. Filistin Laboratuvarı İsrail işgal teknolojilerini dünyaya nasıl ihraç ediyor isimli Metis yayınlarından kısa bir süre önce Türkçesi çıkan bu kitabı konuştuk. Önümüzdeki hafta yine farklı bir başkentten farklı bir konukla yayınımızda buluşmak üzere. Hoşçakalın.